Second right. Samuel chapter three, David's political maneuverings, part three. Like I said, we are going to finish this chapter tonight. But if there's one message I think that the text is trying to show us that God wants us to get is that God ordains sin and evil to bring about the opportunity for his goodness to shine through. That's what we're going to see. Even as David is trying to maneuver through this, really what's happening is God is ordaining this bad situation to happen so that God's goodness in David can shine through. Now, let's remember, early in the chapter, we have our little review that David had a great success in laying the foundation for his future failure. David was doing well, his his house was growing, but we see in there the seeds of his later idolatry set up. But right now, it's going really well. And then back in Israel, Abner, the chief general of the family of Saul, he's also doing really well, but he starts to do a little too well. He gets to make some power play, trying to um, make his position for the throne. Ishbosheth calls him on it. He gets angry and says, Fine, I'm going to go support David. And then his pragmatism sets up David's position. Abner basically attempted to throw all his support behind David, saying in verse 9, God do so to Abner, and more also, if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan to Beersheba. And then Abner went and contacts David, sending him messengers, trying to convince him to support a unification under David. Abner says, I can bring all the people to you. David's response, oh, okay, but bring me back my wife, Michal. We talked about how that was to give him a position of authority. He was now an inheritor of Saul's crown because he was married to his daughter. And he convinces all the elders of Israel and Benjamin to follow David, saying, um, For some time past, you have been seeking David as king over of you. This is verse 17. Now then bring it about, for the Lord had promised David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hands of the Philistines and from the hands of all their enemies. But I want you guys to remember... Did Abner care about God and what God wanted when he was trying to make David king? No. Does anyone remember why? How do we know he doesn't care? Since to chase personal ambition. Yeah, he chased his personal ambition. He didn't care when he was king over Saul's armies. He didn't care when he was king over, or when he was general, I'm sorry, general over Ishbosheth's armies. Suddenly he cares when his position is threatened. This, this is the problem with pragmatism. You could be doing the right thing for the wrong reason. Where he's like, well, this is the right thing to do, but he's doing it for himself. And his reasoning, though, resonates with the elders. They're like, yeah, okay, let's make David king. And he just wants to be on the winning side. So they come together and they're going to make David king. David agrees and sets him up. But sins get in the way. And we're going to see how the sin allows David, the sins allow David to demonstrate God's kind of king. He's going to have the opportunity to show how the way of God is different than the way of the world. The king of Israel is supposed to be different than all the other nations. And this comes about, as we previously saw, Joab anger rises, threatening the set up peace. Joab, in verses 22 through 25, came to David when he heard about um, Abner coming in, and he expressed utter contempt for Abner, saying, he's deceptive. He's a spy. He's trying to deceive you. He accuses David of doing wrong, but what's crazy, and we'll see this in a minute, is everything he accuses Abner of is equally true about himself. He is a liar, He is a spy. He is a concealer. 
So Joab doesn't get David's approval, but he walks out of his presence. You can almost imagine in a huff, right? You, you know those scenes where people go their own way having said what they wanted to say, and you're like, wow, that didn't help at all, but he got it off his chest. Maybe it's done with, but you're like, eh, I don't know if it's actually done with. He wasn't done. And so without David's approval, Joab goes and assassinates Abner, whom he deceives. Verses 26 and 27. When Joab came out from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner, and they brought him back from the cistern of Sirah, but David did not know about it. Then when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside into the midst of the gate to speak with him privately, and there he struck him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Azahel, his brother. Again, this is Joab assassinating Abner because Joab leaves the presence of David okay, and sends his own messengers out. It is very interesting. While David is king, right? he is the power rising king. His weakness is seen that Joab is basically able to walk into his, his um, throne room, scold him, walk out, and then send some messengers out completely ignoring what David would want, and no one even questions it. Kind of like how Abner sent out messengers to David instead of going through Ishbosheth when they were angry. Now we see the same problem as David. Like these generals are kind of controlling things a little bit. Just can't be surprised when there are power struggles, right? Even though he was very powerful, he does not openly defy David. He secretly defies David. And it's all to show David has no clue what's going on here. We just got to remember, this is all happening. David has no clue. But Abner has an intricate revenge plan, right? Old phrase, you know, better don't, um, don't get mad, get even. He's trying to get even, and he's very sneaky about it. So this is his intricate revenge plan. Step one, retrieve Abner from Syrah. So... About two miles north, northwest of Hebron, is Syrah. You can see the little green line up there, just a little far distance. And there, there was a cistern that was known. Cistern, if you recall, is a well-like structure, uh, such as this one here. Oh, wait, no. Oh, oh, so there's, there's, there's the cistern of Syrah. And here is the well. So you can see this on the left, and here's in a, in a court in Jerusalem. So there's lots of places like this. These are just deep wells that go in the land, but they usually weren't wells to find underground water. They were wells to collect water. So during the rainy season, which is, why don't we do this in California more? They collected the water that rained so that they could use it later. Genius. It's, it's like, why aren't we using this ancient knowledge? Come on. Um, or using it better, I should say. We, we do store water. I don't want to, but the, um, so they would have these all over the place. And they would collect water, and then, especially in this wilderness area where it was very dry during the summers, they would need a way to have water. So people would often travel, probably Abner and his delegation of 20 men, because remember, Abner came with 20 soldiers probably stop there for refreshments. They left Hebron, they go and stop there, they're filling up, getting ready for the trip back to Israel. So, Joab sends messengers, they run to him, they say, oh, 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 you must come back, there's an important message for you. Or, there's more to be worked out. And so he returns, and step two comes about. Wait for Abner in the city gate. Because, Again, this is secret. He doesn't want anyone else to get to Abner first. Joab wants to be the first one to him. And so Joab is standing at the city gate waiting him. The guy's probably got better things to do, but he has to be there. Abner returns, probably thinking the message is from David. And Joab comes alongside him saying, Ah, Abner, I have a message for you. And thus begins step three isolate Abner. He wants him just himself because Abner is important, right? 
He's the general of Israel. And he has 20 of his best soldiers, well-armed, well-trained soldiers with him. How do you assassinate a man who is surrounded by soldiers? You separate him. So it's interesting, because if you look in your Bible, and it says that um, Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside. You see that? Took him aside. The word took him aside um, is the same word used in Proverbs 7 of the seductive woman. Proverbs 7.21 says, with much seductive speech, she persuades him. She brings him inside. With her smooth talk, she compels him. Joab had assured the king that Abner had come to Hebron to deceive him, right? Now we see Joab deceiving Abner. He is that man. And he takes him through here. The city's gates were often interestingly designed. Sometimes they would have these large outer gates, but then you get into the middle. It might have been this side. And you'll notice it's actually set aside. So on the sides there, you could have people sitting there. Or if someone's trying to invade, you could block their path so it's not as easy. So there's these little crevices. So you go through the main gate, come here to go to the middle gate, and in the middle gate, pull them aside into this corner, right? Where no one else could see. And he's protected. And, And it provides a perfect blind spot, Right? Abner goes with him, probably because his guard is down at the time. They're they're at peace. They've just made a covenant with David. And while, you know, he probably knows there was this issue with Azahel, he clearly was concerned about that. Last time it didn't cause conflict. So, hey, he just negotiated peace. So he brings him aside to tell him a secret. And, of course, step four, he kills Abner. Joab takes out some weapon and strikes him in the stomach. And the narrator explains why he does this. For the blood of Azahel, his brother. Why did he kill Abner? Avenging who? Avenging. He wanted revenge. Again, this is all a revenge plan, right? He didn't do this to protect David. He didn't do this even ultimately for his own protection. He did this out of vengeance. And recall, if you go back to chapter 2, verse 23, Abner struck Azahel in the stomach with the butt of his spear so that the spear came out his back and he fell there and died where he was. You almost imagine that Joab had thought of, this is poetic justice. You, you killed my brother in the stomach, now I kill you in the stomach. And there's, there's precedent for this, because in the ancient world, they didn't have police forces, they didn't have FBIs and military that would deal out justice. It was really hard. You know, the king had some power, but the kings were isolated. It, The way it was commanded, and God put parameters on this, in Numbers 35, a murder victim, a murder victim's family, their nearest relative, was supposed to go and take the life of the murderer. Numbers 35, 19 through 20. It was his duty to the widow, the other family members, and society, because murderers should not be allowed to live. Numbers 35.31 says there was no way to ransom a murderer. Murderers had to be dealt with. So, you could argue, this was a pretty successful plan of avenging his brother's death. Because his brother was killed. Only one problem. Azahel's death did not qualify as murder. Because, do you guys remember, what end of the spear did Abner use against Azahel? Yeah. You recall, not the spear, but the butt. And if you remember, again, we talked about this. If you want to kill someone for sure, if you premeditated, which is a key concept of murder, you premeditated, want them dead, which side are you going to use? The pointy end. Yeah, exactly. So he was not trying to kill Azahel. So not only was he not trying to kill him, they were at wartime, they were fighting, he 
he gave him warning. He was chasing him down. So, even if he was not, tr- so even if it was an accident, the scripture laid out rules for this. In Deuteronomy 19, 4 through 6, you don't have to turn there, just write it down. There was laid out what was called the cities of refuge, where local authorities would grant asylum. And you know what one of those cities of refuge was? Nope. Good guess, though. Even better. Hebron. Hebron was one of the... So you think about it this way. What was supposed to happen is if a man accidentally killed someone and he was worried that he, that he was going to be killed by an avenger... He would go to a city of refuge and he would be safe there and no one could touch him. And the elders would then take him and review the case. And they would decide, hey, this was murder or you know what? This was an accident. And if it was murder, they would hand him over to be killed for the consequence of his his, um, crime. But if it was an accident or if it was not premeditated, then he would be forced to stay within that city of refuge until the high, next high priest died. But it was a way of preventing. God pre- created this law to prevent revenge from taking hold. So you can imagine, as soon as Abner walked into the city of Hebron, did Joab have any right to kill him? None whatsoever. He could have accused and say, David, he needs to be judged because he killed my brother. But this is the reality. Yeah, this was a great plan, but Joab does not just defy David. He defies the law of God. And this could have destroyed peace completely. Right? Israel was supposed to be a united kingdom, right? Or, or you could describe it as a body, because the church is described as a body and it has its various parts. It's supposed to be unity. And sadly, Joab was really acting like an autoimmune disease. It's interesting. I love just biology and the way things work. But our body, our immune system, is incredibly adept at going after foreign things. So we get sick, and our immune system goes after it, and it kills it. Sometimes it takes a little longer than others, but it does a great job. Only problem is, it's not always as smart as we would like it to be. And sometimes, as the immune system is bouncing around looking for foreign articles, an accident happens, and your little antibodies pick up on something inside your body, like your blood cells, for example, happens. And so a little antibody bounces along, it clings to a blood cell, and then all the other immune system particles start to come upon that and eat away at the person's own body. Autoimmune diseases are some of the hardest things because your only solution to them, in the short run, is to wipe out your immune system, which is supposed to keep you healthy and safe. And it's this horrible response of how you begin to deal with it. And sadly, this is exactly what happens when we let personal insults make us obey God's law, disobey God's law and break unity in the church. All it takes is someone like Abner to refuse to forgive or to refuse to let go of an offense or to even understand how the offense could have taken place to break unity and to bring others into the same attack. You think about it, like, there are other people that, and we'll find out in a minute here too, that Joab brought into this. Joab brought other people to, into his personal vendetta and caused them to participate in the murder of Abner. The same way in the church, so often lines can be drawn when Matthew 18 says, deal with just the two of you, and then expand it as necessary. But line, like whole churches are split down the middle over some issue or another. We talked about Challie's suggestions for keeping unity last week, but I want to just briefly reflect on David's failure here too. Because David was aware of certain things needing to take place if he made this covenant. What what was his requirement, his one requirement for becoming this king and making this covenant? He needed his wife back. And he could have insisted on other things too, like, hey, Abner, you killed Joab's brother. 
I think we need to have a sit down about this. He could have. You know, he should have known there was bad blood between them. And I think for me at least, the lesson is we got to remember that sin goes deep. And just because someone sees they're all right doesn't mean that they actually are. We need to be aware of hurts at times to help prevent something worse to happen. But here's the bigger thing. God, for a moment, is not out of control, even if when David is failing, right? He might, maybe he should have acted. Text doesn't incriminate him one way or the other. But we do know this. Romans 8. Isn't it a glorious passage? Where it says, He who did not spare his own son, how much more will he give us all things? And when we mess up like David did, God doesn't just give us second chances, or third chances, or 520th chances. God is working even in that bad situation to bring about good in our lives and the lives of others. Because this is what happens with David. Right? Though David did not act, though Joab sins here, it's all setting up so that we can see David's humility, which will reveal his innocence and show him to be the right kind of king. Any mistakes and this sin is all being used by God to set up the fact that David is innocent and he is a good king. Because right now, David has a problem, right? Because the news is going to get back very quickly to the elders of Israel that Abner has been killed. And if you are an elder of Israel and you hear that Abner was killed by David's chief general, who are you going to think should be blamed? David, yeah. They're going to think this was a plot by David to remove the last obstacle of his seizure of power because Abner was the one holding up Ishbosheth's throne. So what is he going to do? It would be so easy to just not do anything, but then, because again, he can act. He, he has the main opponent out of the way. But if he does that, then his kingdom is going to be built on disgraceful murders. And so instead, David responds with four condemnations. Four different ways that this act is condemned. And it starts with him just expressing his anger against Joab. Verses 28 and 29. Afterward, when David heard of it, he said, I and my kingdom are forever guiltless before the Lord for the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. May it fall upon the head of Joab and upon his father's house, and may the house of Joab never be without one who has a discharge, or one who is leprous, or one who holds a spindle, or who falls by the sword, or who lacks bread. It's interesting. If you think about it, perhaps maybe part of Joab's mind believed he was loyal to David. He did say, after all, that Abner would betray David. And he might be thinking this is a good thing. David will praise him. But he quickly finds out that his ways are not the king's ways. Murder is not the way to take power. And David's response is to distance himself from Joab, saying, He's innocent. He's guiltless. We could, you, you could imagine this as being like, um, I don't know if you guys have paid attention to the news, there's a certain prince in the news who uh, basically was claimed that he had nothing to do with the murder of a journalist in his country's consulate when those people who murdered him worked directly for him. And everyone was looking at him going, eh, it looks like you did have something to do with it. David doesn't want that to be the case. And so here he uses very strong legal terms. Basically, like he's washing his blood saying, I have known nothing. I have heard nothing. I had nothing to do with us. I am guiltless. Some, and does such a strong job of presenting this that he convinces all the people. There is no question in people's minds over whether he actually had something to do with this. 
Part of that because he instead places huge curses upon Joab. He says, May this fall upon the head of Joab and upon all his father's house. Interestingly, we don't actually know who his father is. Joab was the son of David's sister, Zeruiah, and that's the only name we ever get. But it's basically saying it's going to be on all their family. And the curse is fivefold. First, he says, may someone in his family always have a discharge, thus being cut off from the people. Discharge would basically be a very isolating effect on the person because they would be unclean, and anything they came in contact with would be unclean. Leviticus 15, 1 through 8, describes these discharges from the body, saying, when any man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. And every bed on which the one with the discharge lies shall be unclean. And everything on which he sits shall be unclean. And anyone who touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever sits on anything which the one with the discharge has sat shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Just imagine if you knew that someone was so sick that anything they sat on or touched would make you sick as well, how would you treat that person? Or how would most people treat that person if we're going to be very uncompassionate? You exile them. Like, you know, you want to and that's what happened. These people, they, they would be exiled. And he's basically saying, may this always happen. May there be no chance for cleanliness. May they experience this forever, be cut off from the people. And only that, he says, may the family be leprous, having some kind of infectious skin disease. Not necessarily modern day leprosy, but a skin disease of some kind. And the people would be exiled, like these lepers who were sitting outside of Jerusalem. They're cut off from the rest of the people. It says, may it, he always have someone who holds a spindle. Uh, it's a very strange thing to say. Um, the Holman Christian Standard Bible describes this as a man who can... Um, who can only work the device that spins yard. So here's a picture of an ancient Egyptian with a spinning device as a spindle in their hand. So the idea is, it's saying, may he be so injured that all the person can do is a sitting job. I, I, we might think of that as a little silly because what does everyone do? Most of the time they sit at a desk. But back then, it's basically an insult. Like some, He could only ever do this menial, menial job. Or the NIV translates it, a crutch. It could be a crutch. It'd be the only time that it's translated that way. Um, But either way, he's basically describing, may he always have someone in his family who's injured in some way. Of course, we got falls by a sword. Pretty self-evident. Man be killed. Genesis 9, verse 6 says, Whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. Genesis 9, 6. Like, you killed a man, may your descendants always be killed. And, of course, lack of bread, may they starve. Is David being nice to Joab and his family here? No way. Like, this, this is strong language. But David is actually living out the Old Covenant. Again, just jot this down. Deuteronomy 27, 26 says, Cursed be anyone who does not confirm to the words of this law by doing them. And all the people said, Amen. Deuteronomy 27, 26. You recall, Abner doesn't just violate David's wishes. He violates the law of Yahweh. And so he deserves these curses. And the Old Testament brings out again and again how the sins of the father pass on to the son. 
The children learn the ways of their parents, they learn the sins of their parents, and they commit those same sins, and so have the same consequences. But here's the question. Should we curse someone like David did? You know, someone who does something really horrendous in the church, in, in our homes, in our city, whatever, should we curse them? And Jared, I think you're right. No. For, there's a number of reasons. One, James 3 verse 9 says that our mouth should not have both blessings and cursings coming out of it, which basically prohibits cursing someone. We also see David's curse here doesn't necessarily do anything. Some people will read into these Old Testament curses and say, oh, look at the spiritual power. There's no consequence here because we actually don't read anything about Joab's children. He maybe didn't have any of them or they were so inconsequential this isn't brought up again. Unlike other curses given by God which do have consequences. But even in the Old Covenant... Even when we talk about those who receive family curses, it's told very clearly that they do not have to bear the weight of their parents' sin. Leviticus chapter 26, 40 through 42, says, If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers, if then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember the, my covenant with Jacob. Leviticus 26, 40 through 42. The fact is, all of us have to deal with the consequences of the generations that have gone before us. Right? Even going all the way back to Adam and Eve. Like, why do you and I struggle with sin? Why do we live in a sinful world? Because Adam and Eve sinned, right? They talk about a generational curse that still is affecting us. But let's be honest here, okay? We would do the same thing in their place, right? So let's not just blame them. But in the New Covenant, we have the great blessing that Jesus became a curse for us. So we no longer have to live under the curse. So if we have been freed from a curse, we should not then curse other people. It's interesting, even despite David's strong language here, there's no recorded punishment of Joab. Pastor Richard Phillips explains the saying, David was either unable or unwilling to punish his nephew, but David meant to say by his curses that God would not permit Joab's sin to go unpunished, even if David did. They're basically saying God is going to have to deal with this because David could not. But his condemnation of Joab is probably supposed to be poetically. David was a great poet, kind of poetically contradicted by his praise of Abner because not only does he distance himself by accusing Joab, but he also does so by mourning Abner. He curses Joab and he praises Abner, verses 30 through 35. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner because he had put their brother Azahel to death in the battle of Gibeon, summarizing what had just happened. Then David said to Joab and all the people who were with him, tear your clothes and put on sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And King David followed the buyer. They buried Abner at Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. And the king lamented for Abner, saying, Should Abner die as a fool? As a fool dies? Your hands were not bound. Your feet were not fettered. As one falls before the wicked, you have fallen. All the people wept over him. Then all the people came to persuade David to eat bread while it was yet day. But David swore, saying, God, do so to me, and more also, if I taste bread or anything else till the sun goes down. So David begins a state funeral for Abner by addressing 
his killers first and foremost. It's an interesting way to do it. He starts this grand process of a huge ceremony by looking at the killers. And Joab and all his soldiers, probably those who were involved in the actual death, tricking him, or those who just run raids with him, he commands them to put on the signs of mourning. He says, you must tear your clothes, which is the symbol of inward anguish. The mourners, it's a violent expression. It was them saying, I, my clothes must be ripped. I am so sad. Sackcloth was rough material that was put on to itch your body and remind you every time you moved that you were upset. And they were told to mourn like these Egyptian professional mourners would go through wailing in the streets. And they could, think of it this way, They've been fighting a long time. In chapter 2, they engaged in this great battle and they just wiped the, fl- fl- wiped the ground with um, Abner's forces. They have now killed their opponent. This is a time where they would want to be rejoicing. They have defeated the enemy. And what does David make them do? Mourn and weep like they lost a family member. And this would be so humiliating for Joab because this funeral would be saying that Abner was not the king's enemy, but his friend. By forcing Joab to join in this funeral march, David was requiring him to publicly acknowledge that his deed was not loyalty to the king, but treachery. And Abner is going to be honored then. King David follows himself behind the bier or a coffin that would be carried along, like, again, again, these Egyptian sources help us see it, right here in the middle. And they would walk along with people before it and back it through the streets. David at the back. He's also honored because he's buried in Hebron. Even though he's a Benjamite, But this is a city known as being uh, the home of Abraham. And it's David basically saying, Abner was not his enemy, but his man, his family. And so he is buried in David's city. Think of it kind of like this. It's like a U.S. president with the returned body of a soldier who was sent on an unauthorized war, right? Right? The president has to lead the nation in national mourning because this is sad that these young men has been killed and has to be genuine. But at the same time, it has to be a staged event where he's designed to legitimate policy, legitimatize, legitimatize, legitimatize policy, legitimize. How do you say it? Legitimize. Legitimize. Thank you. Legitimize. Get it right. Be careful. I probably shouldn't use words I can't get right. Um, Sometimes I get it wrong. David is trying to bring peace here. he, He is sad, but he's also trying to bring peace and say, what is our government going to be about? And again, the flip side of his curse of Joab is his praise of Abner. Verse 33. Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound. Your feet were not fettered. As one falls before the wicked, you have fallen. He goes, should Abner die as a fool? Proverbs 18.7 says, A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. A fool brings judgment and death upon themselves. Abner was no fool. Was Abner a bound criminal? Was he wrapped up and accused of wrong? No. He was killed like one, but he was not a criminal. Instead, he was killed by the wicked. It's interesting. In this public cry, David says just enough to basically show his regret without incriminating his nephew over this capital crime. He, he, he talks about the wickedness, and those closest would know, but everyone else would wonder what happened. And David is so upset that he refuses to eat even after the standard mourning period is complete. 
you can tell by everyone's reaction, they're, they're really like, wait a second, what? He's fasting out of respect for his enemy. People didn't do that. This is lasting too long. And it almost seems like David's going overboard with his emotive response, right? You're like, whoa, David, what? But he's doing this for the sake of the unity of his people. A civil war could now start. David has to show that this is not okay. We will not fight each other. We will not kill each other to take power. And David sometimes seems very powerless here. He, he seems like he has not been able to stop this. And now all he can do is cry. And it's very interesting. If you look at the end of verse 31, it says, King David followed the buyer. This is the first time we see the title, King David. And it says in verse 32, they buried Abner at Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice. This is the first time the narrator calls him the king. Because if you look down a little bit fur- further in verse 37, all the people and all Israel understood that day. You know who's watching David? The entire nation. Do you know who David is acting as an example for? The entire nation. David is right now the king. For the first time, he is the king. Yes, Joab had put the peace horribly at wrench. He, David's plans were swinging, and he just threw a wrench right at them, and the sprockets are going flying in all directions. But God is saying, David is and will be king. Because I think we could all be honest and talk about our lives, that life is hard. Right? And I know... It was funny because we were talking about this with my kids and how oftentimes, you know, in, in kids shows, they paint these picture perfect worlds and just it's so simple. And I think sometimes in our early Christian lives, whether it's through the preaching we hear and we don't understand it or maybe maybe the preacher gave it too rosy. We're trying to simplify it a little bit. Maybe there's things, but we, we tend to think at times the Christian life is going to be good. It's going to be easy. Like we gotta, we, we, We've put away our sin. We've followed Christ. It's going to be rejoicing all the way. And we find as we go along, actually the reality is it, it's, it's hard. And Peter says as much. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised. Go, what is this? This is some strange thing. He says, Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. David is experiencing suffering, powerlessness, upsets in his plans, and confusions, just as we do. And they are designed by God as joy-making factories. The heat is coming together to create greater joy when we see God's glory revealed. Because if you think about it, if Joab had not murdered Abner, who could have claimed that they made David king? Abner. He could have said, I worked the system. I convinced these people. Because of this evil, God alone is able to say he made David king. And his character shines through as the type of king. In the same way, when we face trials of many kinds, we must remember that God is working to show his strength in us so that he receives the glory and we receive the joy. We have to take heart when things go wrong. Because David's example shows us God is working. And God never gets it wrong because the response to David's mourning of Abner 
is everyone acknowledges David's innocence. Not only is David condemning these actions, the people see that David had nothing to do with it, and so the condemnation only goes on to Joab. Verse 36, all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them. And everything that the king did pleased all the people. So all the people and all Israel understood that day that it had not been the king's will to put to death Abner, the son of Ner. All the people see David and they're convinced by him. Like This is not a man who is playing a game. This is not a man who's lying. Nobody, no ancient Near East king would do this when their enemy was killed. David's conduct erased any question anyone may have had that he had been divisive and that in fact this became a unifying event. He was king over all Israel. Because the people, the people of Israel were convinced. Now they can't yet make him king because of without Abner's influence, Ishbosheth is now the reigning authority and he's still in the way until chapter 5. But when chapter 5 comes about, the people all say, come to Hebron, verse 3, and David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. They were ready. We'll see what happens. So, all the blame falls instead on Joab, and the narrative ends as David praises Abner, and curses Joab once more. 38, 39. The the grand ceremony is over. David retreats back into his inner court and says to his servants, Do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? And I was gentle today. Though anointed king, these men, the sons of Zeruiah, are more severe than I. The Lord repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. He praises Abner before his men, not the public statements, but even in private. So again, the narrator is trying to show us David is not two-faced here. He's not someone who goes you know, before... He, a president who goes before and says nice things about his political opponent in, out in public on national TV and then goes into his inner office and be like, oh, I'm so glad that guy's dead. Like, there's none of that. He is, he is the same man in public as in private. But then he makes these comments in verse 39 about the sons of Zeruiah, his nephews, um, Abner and Abishai. And it has some confusing translation here. You, you can read it in the ESV, which says that, you know, I was gentle today. These, the sons of Zeruiah, are more severe than I. The NET translation, the New English translation, says, Today I am weak, even though I am anointed as king. These men, the sons of Zeruiah, are too much for me to bear. Or the Hebrew is literally translated as, these men are hard from me. So trying to figure out what it means exactly, what, what's going on here. David's basically saying that he is gentle, morally kind, or the word could also mean weak and inexperienced. I'm probably thinking what he's saying here more is that David felt weak right now. Yes, he's gentle in his response, but I think he's describing his own weakness that he cannot accomplish what he wanted. He could not bring peace without bloodshed because his plans were thwarted by Joab and Abishai. But these men are out of control. They are, as it says here, hard from David. They're pushing against him. Though David was the anointed king, He could not control his headstrong generals and nephews. They acted without permission and he could not stop them. Joab doesn't actually receive his judgment until Solomon's reign. One of David's final acts we read about in 1 Kings is to tell Solomon to punish Joab 
for the killing of Abner. And after Joab tries to help um, Adonijah, Solomon's brother, steal the throne. Overall, we get this, that the sinful situation was out of David's control. But God used it to show Israel he was God's kind of king. Or think of it this way. There's really little lasting peace on this earth, right? Because mankind has all kinds of competing agendas. Joab wanted to advance his own cause and thought little of David's concern for the unity of the entire nation. And in the same way, all kinds of conflicts, whether it's conflicts in the nation or in our church or in our own families, comes about because we want something. And we're fighting for it. And the other person wants something different. The solution God gave to solve all this conflict was to bring suffering, right? But not suffering upon the competing people, but upon himself. He took the ultimate evil, the ultimate bad act was the killing of the perfect God-man, Jesus Christ, who had done nothing wrong. And he used that death to bring peace between different people so that our issues become not about what we want, but about what God wants. And what not about what we do, but what Jesus has done for us. When we are in fights, when we're in conflicts, we must remember the gospel, which says that Jesus died so that we might live. We must remember that God is in control and that he will show his glory. Let me pray and then we'll take a few minutes break and discuss. Oh Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the example of David's life that shows even when things are out of control, you are using them. You are not without control. You are not without ability. And you gave David the character to respond correctly so that all the people would follow his gentleness, showing, Lord, that your kingdom is not built upon power seizing, but upon loving others. So, Lord, may we seek to be those kinds of men and women who love others, who serve you, all for the glory of your name. As we experience trials of many kinds, may we remember and see what good you are doing in it. And may you enable us to respond correctly. To the glory of your name, O great God. Amen.